Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Chris Connor. I'm the Chairman and CEO of the Sherwin-Williams Company and Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Loretta Mester, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Fed. Dr. Mester is a widely respected leader and a distinguished economist with research expertise that includes financial institutions, central bank governance, and inflation. As President of one of the country's only 12 Federal Reserve Banks, Dr. Mester is a participant on the Federal Open Market Committee, which sets monetary policy for the United States of America. Dr. Mester was born in Baltimore and graduated with a degree in math and economics from Columbia University and a master's and Ph.D. in economics from Princeton University, where she was the National Science Foundation Fellow, proving once again that not everybody can get into the Ohio State University. <laughs> Before starting as Cleveland Fed President in June of 2014, Dr. Messer had been Executive Vice President and Director of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, where she was the Chief Policy Advisor, attended meetings of the Federal Open Market Committee, and oversaw the economists and analysts in the research department, as well as professionals in the financial statistics department and the payments card center. I had the privilege of serving as the chairman of the search committee that landed Dr. Mester in Cleveland, and if I may be so bold, we did an outstanding job <laughs> in that search. In the year and a half that Dr. Mester has led the Cleveland Fed, she has proven herself as an influential voice around the world, raising Cleveland's profile with speeches in London, Reykjavik, and Paris, and in interviews with publications from Japan, Australia, and Mexico, among many others. Locally, Dr. Mester is a director of the Cle Greater Cleveland Partnership and a trustee of the Cleveland Clinic. She's a proud resident of Cleveland's Warehouse District, and when she gets a moment of free time, which is very rare, she is a devoted fan of the Cleveland Orchestra. On a personal note, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Loretta. She is a tireless worker, a keen intellect, a quick wit, and ex just one of the most delightful people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Most importantly, however, she is a dedicated public servant at a time when our nation really needs clear thinking about economic policy and the way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Dr. Loretta Mester. Chris, thank you very much for that kind introduction and for your service as chair of our board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And thanks to the City Club for the opportunity to speak today to so many of Cleveland's business leaders. Since coming to Cleveland last year, I've made it a point to learn more about the city's many important institutions, and the City Club of Cleveland is certainly a leader among them. It is an honor for me to be included in your list of very distinguished speakers. For more than 100 years, the City Club has fostered the free and open exchange of ideas. It sees value in bringing together people with diverse viewpoints for a civil discussion of a wide variety of topics. The City Club's commitment to free speech and promoting a well-informed community is praiseworthy public service. Although it might not be apparent, the City Club and the Federal Reserve have several things in common. Like the City Club, the Federal Reserve System is over 100 years old, and it too is committed to public service. At meetings of the Federal Open Market Committee, the body within the Fed that's charged with setting monetary policy, my colleagues and I engage in a free and open exchange of, of views. In our case, the topics covered aren't as wide ranging as those discussed at the City Club. We focus on the economy and monetary policy. By design, the discussions at our meetings contain a mosaic of economic information and analysis from all parts of the country. I believe this ability to share what are sometimes diverse views on the state of the economy and policy is one of the strengths of the Federal Reserve System. It allows us to work toward a better informed consensus on monetary policy to promote the Fed's congressionally mandated goals of price stability and maximum employment. Like the City Club, 
the Fed sees value in a well-informed public. And we feel an obligation to explain our policy decisions so that the public and its elected representatives can hold us accountable for those decisions. So today, before we move on to the question and answer portion of the program, which is a highlight of any speaking engagement at the City Club, I would like to offer my perspectives on the economy and monetary policy. Now, as I just mentioned, while the committee comes to a consensus policy decision, there can be a diversity of views around the FOMC table. So I want to note that the views I'll express today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. It may not come as news to you that at its October meeting, the FOMC decided to maintain the target for our policy rate, the federal funds rate, at essentially zero. The committee reached this decision based on an assessment of both realized and expected progress towards our objectives of maximum employment and 2% inflation. To make such an assessment, the committee looks at a wide range of economic information, the official economic statistical releases, and financial market indicators, as well as the information I and other FOMC participants garner by speaking with big business contacts in our regions, including members of our board of directors and advisory groups. When the FOMC says its decisions are data dependent, this is really shorthand for the more comprehensive process of parsing economic and financial information and assessing what it implies about the current state of the economy, the economic outlook, and the risks around that outlook. The FOMC will be doing the same type of analysis at our next meeting in mid-December. We'll be looking at all the incoming information between now and then to see if it supports the FOMC's expectation that the economy will continue to grow at a pace sufficient to generate some further improvement in labor markets and a gradual return of inflation to our target of 2% over the medium run. Now, there's no denying that the U.S. economy has come a long way since the darkest days of the global financial crisis and the Great Recession, which officially ended more than six years ago. Supported by extraordinary monetary policy action, economic fundamentals have strengthened, and in the face of various shocks, the economy has been resilient enough to sustain a moderate pace of growth over the past six years. Of course, over this expansion, the pattern of growth has not been smooth. It's varied over time and over sectors, and 2015 was no exception. We began this year with a slowdown in output growth to less than 1% at an annual pace. The slowdown mainly reflected temporary factors, including severe winter weather and labor disputes at West Coast ports. As those temporary factors abated, we saw growth rebound sharply to almost 4% in the second quarter, only to fall back to 1.5% in the third quarter. That slowdown largely reflected a sharp pullback in the rate at which firms were adding to their inventories from an unsustainably strong pace in the first half of the year. A better gauge of growth in demand is final sales adjusted for inflation. These grew at a solid 3% in the third quarter, suggesting that the economy still has solid underlying momentum. The driver of growth this year has been consumer spending, which makes up about two-thirds of output. And when I say driver, you can take that literally. Consumers have been purchasing vehicles, especially light trucks, in very high volumes, higher than before the recession. Consumer spending on other durable goods and services has also been growing at a solid pace. Growth in personal income and continued improvement in household balance sheets have supported this spending. At a national level, house prices have recovered to levels seen before the crisis, adding to the wealth of homeowners, and we've seen a pickup, a gradual pickup in housing activity, including sales and construction. Fewer households are underwater on their mortgages, and mortgage delinquencies are down. Although stock prices are little changed on net so far this year, the cumulative increase in stock prices since the crisis is significant. Households lost $13 trillion in net worth over the Great Recession. But now, thanks to the cumulative increase in house prices and stock prices, households have recovered that loss and have added another $18 trillion in net worth to their balance sheets. 
Lower energy prices have also boosted households' purchasing power. Oil prices are down about $40 a barrel from a year ago, and gasoline is currently running about $2.30 per gallon, 80 cents lower than a year ago. The U.S. Energy Information Administration estimates that the drop in gasoline prices this year has saved the average household about $700, and it's projecting that expenditures on home heating oil will be 25% lower this winter than last. While on net lower oil prices will be a positive for U.S. economic growth over the medium run, in the near term the drop in oil prices has been a drag on investment in the domestic energy sector and its suppliers. This is affecting growth in certain regions of the country, including parts of eastern Ohio. Investment in drilling and mining equipment is likely to continue to decline for a few more quarters. But outside of energy-related sectors, business investment in equipment and intellectual property continues to grow moderately. <coughs> Manufacturing, aside from motor vehicles, has been one of the soft spots in the economy. Lower oil prices has led to a pullback in manufacturing related to the energy sector. The appreciation and the value of the U.S. dollar over the past year has also weighed on firms with international exposure. Dollar appreciation reflects the expectation that economic growth in the U.S. will continue to be stronger than growth abroad. A stronger dollar means better terms of trade for U.S. consumers and businesses, which is a positive for a growing economy in the longer run. But in the near term, slower growth in our trading partners and the dollar appreciation are drags on U.S. export growth, and I expect next net exports to be a negative influence on real GDP growth for somewhat longer. The good news is that the recent change in the value of the dollar and oil prices haven't been as sharp. So I expect both drags to lessen over time and to be outweighed by growth in other sectors, including consumer spending and housing. You may recall that in August, there was an episode of significant volatility in financial markets and a tightening in credit conditions. Stock prices fell and credit spreads rose. These financial market developments appear to have been touched off by concerns about the prospects for growth in China and other emerging market economies. Since then, volatility has subsided and equity markets have stabilized. As the FOMC indicated in its, in its October statement, some of the downside risks related to global economic and financial developments have diminished. But the possibility of a sharper than anticipated decline in global growth remains a risk to the outlook and we will continue to monitor for signs of spillovers to the U.S. economy. One question is whether the softening we saw in U.S. growth in the third quarter is signaling a more persistent slowdown in momentum that changes the medium run outlook, which is the relevant time horizon for monetary policy. My answer is no. The resiliency of the economy through the episode in August as well as the strength in final sales in the third quarter, suggests to me that there continues to be positive economic momentum. I anticipate that after the weak third quarter, growth will pick up over the rest of this year and next to an above trend pace in the two and a half to two and three quarter percent range. I recently revised down my estimate of longer run growth to two and a quarter percent, a quarter of a percentage point lower than my previous estimate. My revision reflects the Bureau of Labor Statistics' recent downward revisions to past productivity growth. Many factors, inclu including trend labor force participation, structural productivity growth, and technological innovation affect the nation's longer run growth potential. And there's considerable uncertainty around estimates of potential growth. In fact, it's noteworthy that economists have been revising down their estimates of potential growth almost every year since the Great Recession started. For example, in 2008, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that potential growth between 2008 and 2013 would average 2.5%, well above its current estimate of 1.5% for the same time period. Similarly, over time, FOMC participants have lowered their projections for longer run growth. The FOMC began releasing these longer run projections in January 2009. At that time, the central tendency of the participants' projections of longer run GDP growth was 2.5 to 2.7 percent. In the projections released in September, the central tendency was down to 1.8 to 2.2 percent. 
The implication is that even though the economy has been growing at a relatively moderate pace over the expansion, that pace has been significant to, uh, or sufficient to generate significant cumulative improvements in the labor market. It's good to remember how far we've come. Over the past six years, the unemployment rate has been halved, falling from a high of 10% in October 2009 to 5% this October. It's down over half of a percentage point since the end of last year. Non-farm payrolls are now more than 4 million above their previous peak before the Great Recession. More than 2 million jobs have been added this year, and these have been full-time jobs. Last Friday, we learned that following softer gains in August and September, firms added a very robust 271,000 jobs in October. So far this year, payroll gains have averaged a little more than 200,000 jobs per month. As we often say, we shouldn't read too much into one month's number given the month-to-month -month variation in these readings and the fact that there are still revisions to come. That was true of the softer numbers in August and September. And it's just as true of the outside's gain in October, which I doubt will be repeated in November. It's better to smooth through the volatility. Over the past three months, firms added an average of 187,000 jobs per month. This is somewhat slower than the pace seen earlier in the year. But given the cumulative gains that have been made on the job front and the level of employment growth that's consistent with full employment over the longer run, we should be expecting payroll job growth to slow. Economists currently estimate that monthly payroll growth in the 75,000 to 120,000 range would be enough to keep the unemployment rate constant. This is lower than the, in the past because labor force participation rates have been trending down with the aging of the population and the increase in college enrollments. But notice that this means that even the softer average monthly gain of 140,000 45,000 jobs in August and September is enough to put downward pressure on the unemployment rate. A broad array of other labor market indicators have improved significantly over the past few years, although they're not quite back to pre-recession levels. These measures include the long-term unemployment rate, as well as the unemployment rate that includes discouraged workers and part-time workers who would rather work full-time. Now, despite the improvement in labor markets, so far we have not seen broad-based acceleration in wages. But signs point to firming. Average hourly earnings growth strengthened in October. We've heard from business contacts in our region that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find qualified workers in specific occupations and industries, including construction, IT, and specialized manufacturing. In fact, our construction contacts report that the primary downside risk they face is a shortage of labor, not potentially higher interest rates. There are similar indications from other parts of the country. Firms report having to raise wages to attract and retain workers in these occupations. The recent contract deal at General Motors includes salary increases in the 3 to 4 percent range and higher entry-level wages. As labor markets continue to improve, I expect to see some broader acceleration in compensation. In my view, the totality of evidence suggests that the economy is at or barely nearly at the Fed's mandated monetary policy goal of maximum employment. And with growth resuming at an above trend pace, I expect to see further improvement. This isn't to say that there aren't longer term challenges facing the labor market. Workforce development is a key issue. As a country, we want to ensure that people can enter and remain productive members of the labor force to raise our standards of living and to make us more competitive in the global economy. Monetary policy is not the tool for addressing this important issue, but the Federal Reserve, through its role in promoting community development, is certainly committed to helping identify effective policies and best practices for strengthening and increasing access to education and training. In fact, this past June, the Cleveland, Philadelphia, and Richmond Feds hosted a policy summit that brought together practitioners, researchers, and policymakers working on these issues. As I mentioned, an important role of a Federal Reserve Bank president is gathering information from Main Street to help inform monetary policy. So let me spend a few minutes on economic developments in the 4th Federal Reserve District, which encompasses all of Ohio, 
western Pennsylvania, eastern Kentucky, and the northern panhandle of West Virginia. While our region is quite diverse, the path of economic expansion here has been similar to the nation's. Regional firms with international exposure, such as the steel industry, continue to struggle. Shale gas production levels remain high, but growth in drilling activity has slowed considerably. Auto and auto parts manufacturing represents a significant share of manufacturing in Ohio and Kentucky, and the strength we've seen in this sector has helped to offset some of the weaker manufacturing segments. Like the nation, our region also has been seen considerable improvement in labor markets. In Ohio, the unemployment rate has fallen sharply from a peak of 11% in December 2009 to 4.5% in September, below the national average. Firms have been adding jobs, but at a slower pace than in the nation. Over the past year, the pace of job growth in Ohio has been only half that of the U.S. as a whole. And while U.S. employment is now 3% above its pre-recession peak, employment in Ohio is not quite back to that benchmark. This slower job growth in the state relative to the nation is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening since the mid-1990s. It partly reflects the slower population growth and older population in Ohio, as well as Ohio's higher share of jobs in manufacturing, a sector that's been experiencing a long-run decline in employment. Manufacturing accounts for about 15% of private sector jobs in Ohio, compared to about 10% in the U.S. These shares are down, both down about seven percentage points since the mid-1990s. As the regional economy becomes less reliant on old-style manufacturing and more reliant on higher skilled manufacturing and service sector jobs in fields such as education and health care, it faces the challenge of ensuring that its population can gain the necessary skills to enter and remain productive members of the modern labor force. So workforce development is a challenge here, just as it is for the nation as a whole. In addition to maximum employment, the other part of the Fed's dual mandate is price stability. Inflation has been below the Fed's 2% goal for some time. Headline inflation has been running at about a quarter of a percent so far this year, as measured by the year-over-year -year percentage change in the price index for personal consumption expenditures. Excluding food and energy prices, which tend to be volatile, so-called core inflation has been running about 1.3%. Low inflation partly reflects the transitory effects of the sharp drop in energy prices, as well as the appreciation of the dollar, which makes non-petroleum imports cheaper in the U.S. Incoming data are consistent with the inflation dynamics that the FOMC has been expecting. As changes in oil prices and the value of the dollar have tempered, the downward pressure on inflation has started to wane. Recent readings on underlying inflation, including the core, trim mean, and median, median CPI measures have moved up. For example, the year-over-year -year change in the Cleveland Fed's median CPI measure rose to 2.5% in September. There's considerable uncertainty around any inflation forecast, but analysis by Cleveland staff and others suggest that core measures of inflation can improve forecasts of headline inflation, at least over some time horizons, and in some cases, the improvement is statistically significant. Inflation expectations are an important factor shaping the inflation outlook. And in my view, inflation expectations remain well anchored. Survey-based measures of inflation expectations of both consumers and professional forecasters have been stable, despite the low re readings of actual inflation. These survey measures have historically done well at capturing longer-run trends in inflation, and they've been shown to help in forecasting inflation. Inflation compensation, measured by the spread between yields on Treasury securities and Treasury inflation-protected securities, so-called TIPS, have moved down a bit. But analysis suggests that this likely reflects liquidity effects and changes in inflation risk premiums more so than changes in inflation expectations. Cleveland Fed staff analysis also suggests that the fall in inflation and compensation may be reflecting the sharp drop in energy prices since last year, which might reverse as movement in oil prices moderate. I expect inflation to remain low in the near term, but the firming in the core measures, the stability in inflation expectations, the economy's expected return to above-trend growth, 
and continued improvement in labor markets are all factors making me reasonably confident that inflation will gradually return to our 2% goal over the median run. Of course, my economic outlook is dependent on appropriate monetary policy. So let me turn to that now. It's well accepted that monetary policy needs to be forward-looking. Because monetary policy affects the economy with a lag, rates will need to begin to move up from their very low level before we have fully reached our goals. The FOMC anticipates that two criteria need to be satisfied before it will be appropriate to raise the federal funds rate. Some further improvement in the labor market and reasonable confidence that inflation will move back to its 2% objective over the medium term. In deciding whether these conditions have been met and whether it's appropriate to raise the target rate for the Fed funds rate, the FOMC has to balance a number of considerations. My colleagues and I are all committed to promoting the goals of price stability and maximum employment, but we may have different views about realized and anticipated progress towards those goals and about the potential costs and benefits to changes in policy. Given the current stage of business and policy cycles, I find this diversity neither surprising nor troubling. In September and October, the FOMC's consensus expectation was that labor market conditions will continue to improve and that inflation will return to target over time. But the committee decided it was prudent to await further evidence supporting this expectation before lifting off from zero. My own assessment is that with the economic process, progress we've made and that I expect to continue, the economy can handle an increase in the Fed funds rate. In my view, if economic information continues to come in consistent with the outlook, then there will be a strong case that the conditions for liftoff have been met, and it would be prudent for monetary policy to take a step back from the emergency measure of zero interest rates. A small increase in interest rates from zero is not tight monetary policy. And while I would expect some reaction in financial markets to the first move in interest rates in over six years, I wouldn't expect financial conditions to tighten enough to affect the median term outlook. More important for macroeconomic performance is the expected path of policy beyond liftoff, because expectations about the future path of policy can affect today's economic decisions. Decisions about the path will depend on incoming information on the economy's performance. But according to the FOMC's current assessment of the economic outlook, even after the first rate increase, monetary policy is expected to remain very accommodative for some time to come, with rates expected to move up only gradually to more normal levels. Of course, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, there's some uncertainty about what normal level of interest rates is. If the potential growth rate of the economy over the longer run has moved lower, as many economists estimate, that means the longer run level of the Fed funds rate consistent with price stability and maximum employment is also lower than it was in earlier periods. But estimates of long run growth are imprecise and subject to revision. So this means there is considerable uncertainty around this neutral Fed funds rate as well. One benefit of a gradual approach to normalization is that it will allow us to recalibrate policy over time as some of the uncertainties surrounding the longer term level of interest rates the economy's potential growth rate and the longer run unemployment rate are resolved. But uncertainty about the longer run destination is not an argument to delay taking the first step. In fact, in my view, given the economic outlook, starting the process to normalize interest rates will help ensure that we can indeed take a gradual approach. Delay risks having to move rates up more steeply in order to promote attainment of our goals over time. Another cost of postponing liftoff too long is the potential for building risk to financial stability stemming from excessive leverage or from investors taking on risks they are ill-equipped to manage in a search for yield. The FOMC continues to carefully monitor financial markets for signs of these types of emerging problems. However, we need to acknowledge that leading up to the financial crisis, some of the vulnerabilities of the financial system were not fully recognized by policymakers. Although we've made significant strides since then, there likely remain some gaps in our ability to assess the risks in every part of the financial system. The longer interest rates are maintained at zero in an economy that is getting back to normal, the higher the potential risk to financial stability. This potential cost is one that needs to be considered when determining appropriate policy. 
I believe the extraordinary monetary policy actions taken by the FOMC in response to the financial crisis and Great Recession were effective in easing monetary and financial conditions. They kept the Great Recession from turning into another Great Depression. I'd like to ensure that these actions remain a part of the monetary policymakers' toolkit, available for, for, available for use if such an unfortunate situation arises again in the future. But ultimately, how history judges those extraordinary actions will depend on our demonstrating that there's a way out. The time to start that demonstration is quickly approaching. In summary, the economy has made considerable progress over the expansion, and my median run outlook is for above trend growth, continued improvement in labor markets, and inflation gradually returning to our 2% target over the medium run. If incoming economic information continues to support this forecast, then in my view, it will be time to take the first step in the policy normalization process. As I'm sure the learner, learned audience at the City Club knows, jean Paul Sartre was a famous French philosopher and author. His play, No Exit, is a celebrated contribution to existentialist literature. It should not be a guidebook for monetary policymakers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Loretta. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are enjoying a Friday forum featuring Loretta Mester, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. We encourage you to organize questions for our speaker now and remind you that your question should be brief and to the point. If you are joining us via our radio broadcast or webcast and would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via the radio broadcast and web stream provided by our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS 104.9, WCLV Idea Stream are one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Production, distribution, and broadcast of City Club programs are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Be sure to join us on Wednesday, November 18, for a conversation with Jim Robinault, local author, historian, and partner at Thompson Hine and the history of the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is the Nelson E. Weiss Memorial Forum, made possible by many generous endowment gifts from the family, friends, and colleagues of Mr. Weiss. Thank you all for your support. Our community partner for today's forum is Neighborhood Housing Services, Thank you for your support. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by numerous organizations from across the community. Please refer to your printed program for a complete listing. And again, we thank all of you for your support. Lastly, we welcome students from St. Ignatius High School to today's forum. Student participation is made possible by the Mary Jane Spar and Charles E. Spar Charitable Trust. Would the students please stand and be recognized? Gentlemen. <laughs> now it's time to return to Dr. Mester for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky, and Content Associate, Teddy Eisenberg. We're ready for our first question, please. Loretta. Uh, Ms. Mester, uh, great talk. Um, you. As you noted, it is a global world, and part of the reason you haven't raised rates is because of the impact on the foreign exchange rate. Uh, my question is, when you are at the Fed talking about whether to increase rates or not, do you actually talk about the impact on the foreign countries, or is it just focused on U.S.? countries, and are you and other members of the Fed lobbied by the IMF and other countries and their governments and their central banks? So when we talk about financial conditions, of course, one of those financial conditions is the exchange rate. 
our focus is on the U.S. economy. We want to set monetary policy, you know, so that we can achieve our goals of price stability and maximum employment in the U.S. economy. But of course, as you noted, there are global conditions that affect the U.S. economy. So our focus on financial conditions and therefore the exchange rate is how is it going to impact the U.S. economy? Ex how is it going to affect exports? Because um, that's one of the major effects um, of the exchange rate on the U.S. economy is through our trade sector. And then also how it has a smaller effect on import prices and therefore it affects inflation. So it really is focused on the U.S. economy. I personally have not been lobbied by anyone at the IMF, but of course, you know, I can't speak for others on the FOMC. Um, but, you know, they certainly are welcome to, to express their views on monetary policies, just as everyone else in this room is welcome to express their views on policy as well. We know there are tens of thousands of vacant and abandoned residential uh, buildings in the state of Ohio. If we would add in the commercial buildings as well and look at the rest of the district, we can imagine there are s probably several hundred thousand vacant and abandoned structures in your district. And you mentioned as well th that while the, uh, the mor mortgage foreclosure rates are going down, we know that tax foreclosure rates are going up and are significantly elevated from historic levels. So I'm wondering if, uh, if you're thinking about that and if you see that as a burden on the economy in the region you serve. Okay. So there certainly is um, still some problems in the housing markets in our district, and I would say nationally as well in different places in the country. And there's currently work being done by the, the uh, Cleveland Fed and our community development that actually tries to address some policies that could actually help, right, to address this issue. Again, it is an issue, I think, an, a longer term issue for the region. Um, the, the housing crisis was a, is a big um, problem in our region, more so perhaps in other, than in other regions. But again, this was a nationwide thing. And there I are, there's active work going on in sort of policies that will help to, to look, look at that. Land banks are one, and there are other policies to address that. So yeah, I think one of the reasons that the housing market hasn't come back, right, as in typical past cycles, we've seen a much stronger rebound in housing. It's been a very gradual rebound. It's precisely because of the things that you were, you were addressing. Um, it has improved, but there's still a lot, a long way to go there. I agree with that. A uh, number of FOMC participants have described the likely future rate path as gradual or even very gradual. Uh, and I think I heard you mention gradual in your speech today. Uh, what does gradual mean? What does, <laughs> what does very gradual mean? And uh, is gradual the new measured? Thank you. All right, so <laughs> when we say gradual, when I say gradual, I mean that it doesn't necessarily mean going up lockstep each meeting, okay? So one of the things, if you look back at prior tightening cycles, right, we had to raise interest rates quite a bit, right, in, in, in a short, you know, relatively short period of time. So when I'm thinking gradual, I don't think the economy will necessarily mean that we'll need to do that. But I want to reiterate that it's going to depend on how the economy evolves. So my current reading of economic conditions and my outlook would suggest that we can be gradual. And, I, and the benefit of being gradual is we don't really necessarily know right, wh where the end point is. Right? So the gradualness allows us to sort of ass assess things how they go. But again, the continual looking at where the economy is going, incoming information, does it affect your media run outlook? and therefore appropriate policy, that's going to continue to go on, right? When we're saying gradual, we're trying to express what our current read is um, of current conditions and, and the outlook. So I, I want to emphasize and not enough, can't emphasize enough that, you know, we're going to still be doing the assessment of economic conditions. Dr. Mester, during the recent presidential debates, there have been several comments critical of the Fed. Uh, seemingly hinting on less Fed independence, and I'd like your thoughts on that. I firmly believe that an independent Federal Reserve is the right way to do monetary policy. I th we got to remember when we say independent, we mean monetary policy decisions that are not affected by politics. It doesn't mean that the Fed doesn't have oversight, right? We are audited. Much of our work is, you know, subject to, to uh, overview. Right? But when we say an independent Fed, we really mean about the monetary policy process. There's 
a large body of research, both here and abroad, that suggests that when monetary policy is away from the day-to-day -day politics, you get better outcomes for the American public and the public you know, in general, right? You get better economic outcomes. And so I am firmly committed to, to trying to explain the benefit of that. But with that independence comes accountability. We have to be held accountable by the public and by the elected officials. And part of you know, our dialogue today is to try to explain our rationale for our decisions so that you feel that you have an understanding and then you can sort of have this dialogue back and forth about whether we're doing a good job or not. Dr. Messner, uh, last Tuesday at the Republican debate, there were calls for an audit of the Fed. Can you see any benefit to this country by having the Congress auditing the Fed? <laughs> Okay, so again, I want to point out that audit the Fed is really a misnomer. Okay, we are audited. Our financial statements are audited, right? We have external auditors come in and, and audit our statements. When I, you know, what I think the intention of the, of the legislature, or you know, proposed legislation is, it's really to try to inject politics into monetary policy decision making. And that, again, I think is, is a dangerous concept because it would really undermine our ability to set policy that is going to achieve the goals that Congress gave us, which is you know, inflation, price stability and maximum employment. So again, I don't think it's a good idea to have you know, a politics injected into the monetary policy. But again, I do think it's very appropriate for us to be transparent, to, for the Fed to explain its decision making and its rationale, right? We publish, you know, our statement after each meeting, we publish our minutes three weeks after the meetings, we have transcripts that are published five years after the meetings, verbatim transcripts of what conspired at the, you know, happened at the meeting. We have Janet Yellen, the chair, going up before Congress um, at least twice a year, but many more times at, at their request. So we're trying to be as transparent as we can. Um, and again, I think that's important as well for the Federal Reserve to do. We have to be give the information about what we're doing in our rationale so that we can be held accountable to the American people. So again, I think the in, when, when people hear audit the Fed, it just seems a little obvious. You know, why wouldn't they be audit, audited? Well, we are audited. Our financials are audited. It's the other part of it that's the dangerous part of it. Hi. Um, you talk about the dual mandate of uh, inflation targeting and high employment. So our employment numbers are, uh, you know, really high right now, but I wonder uh, how much you consider the falling labor force participation in your decisions at the Cleveland Fed or at the uh, FOMC. Right. So you're right. There's a there labor force participation rates are trending down um, over time because we're getting older as a nation, and we also have higher college enrollment rates, and that affects um, the, the over the expansion, right? At some point, labor force participation was well below that trend. But in recent times, it's about on trend. And so the, the recent data, right, actually the last em employment report actually didn't ha show, you know, much change in labor force participation. So across the board, the last employment report was very strong. I think if you look over time, over the expansion, on a number of dimensions, right, the, the labor force is, you know, improved in a lot of different dimensions. And so, you know, a lot of people will cite the labor force participation rate as a reason not to look at the headline unemployment number and saying, well, it's a little misleading. And that's why we look at all those different indicators under, you know, under utilization of labor, long-term unemployment rates, part-time versus full-time. We're looking at all, a whole panoply of different statistics. And in my own personal view, across all those dimensions, we're nearly at or at full employment from the point of view of monetary policy. I grant there's a lot of longer term issues in the labor market, but monetary policy really can't do much about those, right? It takes other policies for those. Workforce development is one of the things that I think we need as a country to be focused on. Whether rates uh, go up gradually or very gradually, uh, there's going to be an effect on we the people because we have been, shall we say, financing the federal debt there's going to be a significant impact on the cost of financing of that federal debt and the deficits which, you, which attribute to it. 
how are we going to handle that increase which we have not been dealing with over the past years? So this is a fiscal policy question. Um, there's no doubt, and of course the Fed is concerned with monetary policy. We don't venture into to fiscal policy, but there's no doubt that we as a country need to figure out a sustainable path for our fiscal um, debt, our policy, our debt, fiscal policy. We need to get back on a sustainable path. Um, and that's something that Congress and, you know, others, the White House, need to do because it is something that's a, a longer run um, problem for this nation. So recognizing that you have a confident view of the economy going forward, um, taking that into effect, though, can you comment on the Fed's ability to mitigate a potential recession, either in the near term or the midterm, given that funds rates are the lowest they've been in history and the Fed's balance sheet of, as a percentage of GDP is the highest it's been since the Great Depression? Right. So as we showed during the uh, Great Recession, and I think most studies have said that we were able to ease credit conditions um, by purchasing assets. So there are tools that are available even if fund rates are at z the fund rate stays at zero. And one of them is, is, is buying more assets. Um, one of them is, is changing the, the maturity of the assets that we hold, again, to put downward pressure on longer term interest rates. So I think those tools work. Um, I think that we, there are limits on perhaps how large you want the balance sheet to get, but you know, at this point, if we needed to, we could enlarge the balance sheet and it would have an effect on long-term rates. My own personal view, as you said, is that the economy is getting back to a more normal path and therefore it, we don't need the emergency zero rate anymore and it would be prudent to actually start beginning to raise rates. But we do have tools that you know we could use if we find ourselves in another situation, even with interest rates at zero or the fund rate at zero. Thank you, Doctor, um, and thank you to the Weiss family. There, some of them are in here in attendance. Uh, um, one of the questions I had is about home ownership rates. Um, Cuyahoga County in Ohio are dipping into the 60s now in terms of home ownership rates. Is that something that we should expect as the new normal? And if so, what are sort of the uh, community effects that that has, um, even though home ownership sort of isn't a perfect asset building tool, um, there are some questions about you know communities of color. That's the primary way that mm -hmm. they build assets in the community. Right. Yeah, again, another in very important longer term uh, issue that the country has to be thinking about. And there is ongoing research about whether we're in a new situation or not. I think it's too early to tell. I mean, the housing crisis was so deep that it's just going to take a long time for, for people to get out of it. I think the as mortgage rates, there's still, you know, it's still very hard to get a mortgage for certain types of borrowers, right? Subprime mortgages don't exist, right? If you're well qualified, you can get them. So it's not as clear about whether it's people realizing that, wow, you know, owning a home is a responsibility. I don't want to take on the debt of the mortgage or whether they just can't get access to credit. Again, hard to know which one it is at this point. Um, I could imagine that a lot of people, and we know also, one of the other things we know is that people are starting later, right, to form households and to and to actually take on the debt of a, of a home. I don't think we want to go back to where we were right before the crash. I mean, that was just not a sustainable uh, situation. Um, but you're right that in a lot of households, the way, main way they grow their wealth is by housing. So again, it's a long run issue. I don't have an answer about whether we're in a new normal, but it's certainly something that we're researching and, and want to know more about in terms of how, how to you know, how, what that's implication for the macro economy, but also from the community development point of view. And again, the Cleveland Fed has many people, you know, looking at housing and housing related policies that we talked about earlier to try to help that situation and to make sure that people, one, have access, adequate access to credit if they qualify, and two, do they have the ability to understand what they're taking on when they take on a mortgage, um, and then the implications for, you know, future wealth building. Hello, doctor. My name is Mark Zetzer. I'm from Shaker Heights, and I'm running for Congress in this district. And I do support audit the Fed, a full audit, as well as competition and currency. However, my question is about price inflation. I'm also a father of three children, young children. I've done most of the grocery shopping and cooking for my family. And I've seen 
this one or two for three percent uh, CPI is not my reality. <laughs> I go, uh, the packaging is shrinking, the prices are going up. I can't buy milk for my six-year-old anymore because it's doubled in price in a few years. That's like a 25% annual increase. And it's not just milk, it's across the board. As I want to know is my standard of living is shrinking, okay? We call it shrinkflation. And I haven't seen this since I used to shop with my mom in the 1970s. So this is significant. It's probably closer to 10%. And I want to know what is the Fed going to do? What is your plan? Are you going to try to restore the value of our money so that we can at least maintain our standard of living or maybe even grow our standard of living? Well, the Fed is committed to hitting you know, our 2% goal over the medium run. I think most people would say that actually inflation is below the target. You're suggesting that inflation is above the target in, my experience. in your experience, right? So I would say that I think the BLS does a pretty good job of measuring these things and the, and the BEA and the, and the price, you know, consumer price. Um, the PCE deflator, inflator, which is what the Fed looks at. Um, and they try to do these kind of adjustments for the kinds of things you're talking about, these quality adjustments and packaging adjustments. So we're going to rely on those statistics. Um, and, and those gauges are telling us that at least the headline numbers are below our, our goal and that we need to get inflation back up to 2% over time. So we're committed to hitting our inflation goal from the top or the bottom. So, you know, our goal is 2%, right? My view is we're going to get there over the medium run. And um, by setting appropriate policy, I think we can do that, and which will achieve what you want to achieve, which is price stability. Doctor, there's been much discussion on raising the minimum wage at the federal level up to $15 an hour. In your opinion and thoughts on how that would affect the growth of our economy? Okay, that's a good question. So, you know, there's going to be two effects, right? When you think about, like, an a, a increase in the minimum wage, there's usually two effects. One, increases the wages in the hands of people who have those jobs, right? And two, right, in a competitive labor market, one would think that it would lower the amount of, of employment, right? You see, if you have to pay a higher wage, then you might want to cut back on employment or cut back on hours. And there's considerable, you know, research, economic research over the years on this. Most of the research actually s suggests that the effects on actual employment are small, very minimal effects. Um, but remember, what they're doing is they're only looking at small, it's empirical studies, there have only been small increases in the minimum wage. The things being contemplated are larger, and so it's not clear whether it'll have a, a, a big impact on, on hiring um, which would undermine sort of the increase in the wage. So I think basically my own view is it probably wouldn't have a, as big a significant effect. Um, I, I base it on the research that's been done to date, but I admit that that's based on smaller increases than are being considered now in the minimum. Dr. Muster, uh, you, in your comments, you said that um, the economists and your Fed uh, fellow members have been reducing their forecast of growth from 2.5% to 1.7%, I think, or something in that range. Um, there have been some political candidates that have suggested we ought to have 4% growth. Um, I wanted your comment on whether you think that's very realistic or would be good for the economy to go to that higher growth rate and whether we're healthy where we are. And related to it, you said that we're at full employment, but there's a lot of discussion about um, the fact that lower income workers, particularly even working full time, are not making enough money to survive and support themselves. And what do you think the policy implications are there? It's sort of related to the last question, obviously. Right. So, you know, when, when the Fed thinks about growth, right, we take as, you know, given sort of the economic environment in which we're operating, right? So there are other policies right, that are not within the realm of monetary policy that can affect longer run growth. Monetary policy really doesn't affect the long-term potential growth rate of the economy, right? Other things do, things that, programs that would help productivity, programs that would help in terms of skill sets of our workers, a number of other kinds of programs like that could increase the potential growth rate. Monetary policy isn't one of them. So, you know, when, when people are talking about increasing that, they're talking about policies outside of the realm of monetary policy. Um, you're right, I mean, there's a income distribution 
issues in in the economy again right monetary policy isn't the one isn't the right tool to address those issues right but there are other kinds of policies that the country as a body right could decide is the way to go and and that would be the realm of those other policies the fiscal policy side would could address some of those issues that you're pointing out Dr. Mester, <clears throat> thank you for being here. A wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. The question I had is related to productivity. You've mentioned it a few times. Mm -hmm. And specifically, the below average trend maybe uh, over the last few years, mm -hmm. how concerned are you or the Fed uh, about the lower productivity as it relates to the standard of living over time? So we are, we are talking about that quite a bit um, at the Fed. It is, a, it is a bit of a puzzle of why it's so low. Um, I mean, my own view is that it will come back. I'm a, I'm a little more, if you think about what I told you about the span of, of the Fed policymakers in terms of their potential growth rates or long-term growth rates is what we say in the Fed, right? I'm on the upper end of that central tendency. Uh, and because I really believe in sort of the innovation that the U.S. economy has had over, over the years, and it's those innovation, right, is going to help right, in terms of spurring productivity growth and spurring the potential growth rate of the, com of the, of the country. So I'm kind of on the more optimistic end because I just, you know, feel that we do have a very innovative um, economy. We've lived through a very bad period in terms of the shock that hit us was a very deep shock, and it's taken a long time to get out of that. And over that time period, Right, there's been a number of adjustments that have to have been made. And we've talked about a bunch of them in the room, right? The housing market, these are very, and the labor market. These are very hard things to come back, and it's taken a lot of time. The expansion has been six years. We've had interest rates at zero for a long, long time. So I don't want to sound too optimistic because it has been a very deep hole that we were in, but we've climbed out of it. And my own personal view is that we will see productivity growth regain um, and the long run prospect I'm a, I'm a bit more optimistic than others on the longer term prospects for the US economy Thank you. Today we've been enjoying a City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum featuring Loretta Mester President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland Thank you very much Dr. Mester Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned. <laughs>